comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man. <laughs> Oh, hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> oh, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, except it has been kind of warm. Yes, it has been. What do you do about the heat? Oh, I, I just push fire. Yes, I guess that's just about all anybody can do. Unless you want to sit on a cake of ice. <laughs> oh, then I'd be happy. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Why? Because if you sat on a cake of ice, you'd turn blue. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do cool off when my father sprinkles the garden. Well, that's a nice way of doing it. I'm sure you must look very pretty among all the other roses with dew drops on you all. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You know, we haven't read Prince Val lately, and I've been reading him by myself, and he is in Ireland, and I wonder, can we read him today because it's an interesting adventure? Why, we certainly can. Oh, fine. Could we please go right to the funny... Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do... Let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And since you're so anxious to see what's happening to Prince Val, let's go right past Beetle Bailey on the first page, turn over to page two, and here on page three is Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Magic wits for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hecket, Breckett, Graymalkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> On a mission for his father, Prince Val has come to Ireland, a land of brave and hardy fighting men. Val had met Brian O'Curry, a leader of one of the bravest clans in Ireland. And on their way through the countryside, Val and Brian O'Curry had encountered the forces of Sutton of Wexford, the clans of the two men engage in a big fight. All day it had lasted, until finally a monk called Patrick has appeared and stopped the bloody fight, saying, Let your leaders bear the honor of your clan and decide the issue. So the two leaders square off against each other with swords and shields, and then the duel begins. The great strength of Brian O'Curry is pitted against the shrewd ferocity of Sutton of Wexford, and mightily they fight. As picture top row, the sodden turf turns to mud under their feet as they struggle endlessly. And then the sword of Brian bites deeply into the helmet of Sutton. And first picture, second row, he falls. He gasps. Ah, you have killed me, Brian O'Curry. In our long years of fighting, we're at an end. My brain is cleft from crown to ear. I die. Last picture, second row. Brian O'Curry takes the battered head of Sutton in his arms. Tears run down his hairy cheeks as he sobs. Oh, a dull world it will be with no Sutton to fight. Oh, the splendid warfare we have had. First picture, bottom row, Val grins. I've been in Ireland long enough to suspect that you can't hurt a gale with a blow on the head. Let me see that mortal wound. Hmm. Nasty scalp wound. Bind it up. Sutton's head is bandaged, and he finds he's able to move about all right. The dead are buried, and the wounded are cared for. And then the two clans put up the pavilions and bring out the mead to drink a toast of peace. A man named O'Doherty holds the glass. Last picture, Patrick says to Val... Now come, Sir Valiant, spend the night in my pavilion. When enemies become friends and cement their friendship with mead, there is little chance for sleep. Oh, I think that was an excellent idea of Patrick's to make the leaders do the fighting. So do I. Lots of lives were saved that way. And anyway, I think that if two leaders cause trouble, it isn't fair to ask somebody else to do the fighting. I think you have a very good point. If only the leaders would do the fighting, we'd have no war. Yes, that's what I think. Patrick. 
Patrick is the wise man. Yes, he certainly is. Well, now look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And you remember that Roy and Wild Widow Dowd were going to investigate some camp? Yes, it was a construction camp. Roy thought the crooks who had robbed the railroad payroll might be found there. And, and they were there, and there were three of them, and they know that Roy is coming. And you remember last week the leader, who's holding a great big hammer, said he'll take care of Roy Rogers. I wonder what'll happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip a yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip a yo. <laughs> As Roy and Wildwood are down approach, the leader of the outlaws points behind a pile of railroad ties, saying, All right, I'll try to find out how much they know. Hide here and keep me covered. Hey, hello. You looking for somebody? I'm Hard Rock Higgins, construction foreman. Roy answers, Yeah, maybe you can help us. I'm investigating the railroad payroll robbery that took place at this camp. First picture bottom row, Higgins answers, Sorry, Rogers. I told the sheriff all I know about the payroll robbery. Wildwood can't control her tongue, and she spits out that two men were sneaking away from the carnival after Mike Coe was killed. Yeah, and we trailed him here, Higgins. Just then there's a the sound of falling timber, and Ham, who has climbed to the top of the railroad tie, slips and falls. Last picture, Roy pulls a gun and rushes past Higgins. Hey, somebody's behind those railroad ties. Higgins swings his hammer, saying, Well, you'll never make it, Rogers. And Roy doesn't see what's happening. Oh, if he hits Roy, Roy'll be killed. Oh, I hope Roy turns around. Well, maybe Wildwood will do something to stop Roy from being killed. We'll find out if she does next week. Now let's turn over the page. And here on page six is Walt Disney's story, The Sword and the Rose. Oh, yes. And it's in the early days of England when Henry was king. And you remember that the Princess Mary, who was Henry's sister had followed the king and some of the nobles... And Charles Brandon, who's handsome and brave and daring. Yes, he'd follow them out into the countryside. And then the Princess Mary's horse started to run away, and nobody saw it but Charles Brandon, and he rode after her. Oh, I wonder if he'll save her. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the sword and the rose. It's merry, merry England when knighthood was in flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. Riding swiftly, Brandon soon overtakes the runaway horse. He reaches over and grabs the bridle and pulls in. As he reins in Mary's horse, it slows down quickly. And Brandon realizes that this was no runaway at all, that the princess had merely faked the runaway. The princess says, Help me down, Master Brandon. As he holds up his arms to help her down, she smiles into his eyes. The way you scowl, I marvel that you came to my rescue at all. It's the guardsman's duty to watch over the royal princess. The princess jumps down. First picture bottom row, still holding her arms around his neck, she looks into his eyes and says softly, Can this be the bow, Charles Brandon? Am I a statue on a pedestal? Uh, you are a princess, my lady. I am only a king's guardsman. At this moment, Lady Margaret rides into the dell and calls, My lady, come quickly. There is great news from France. <laughs> Some time later, Brandon and the Princess Mary ride into the courtyard. King Henry and the Duke of Buckingham are watching from a window. The king says, Hmm, my new captain of the guards has been struck down by my merry little sister. And Buckingham replies, Yes, but have you ever seen the Lady Mary herself so smitten before? Last picture, the king chuckles, No, by Lucifer, I haven't. But there's a position to cure her infatuation for Brandon. King Louis of France. Oh, now I know that Princess Mary is in love with Charles Brandon. Yes, and I think that Brandon is in love with her. But he feels because she's a princess that he shouldn't be in love with her. But why? Well, because he's only an ordinary soldier or a man from the common people, while the princess is from royalty. Oh, and princesses and kings are only supposed to marry other royalties? Well, that's the way they tried to do it in those days. And so that's why King Henry wants Mary to become interested in the King of France. That's right. Oh, I hope she doesn't give up Charles Brandon. Do you think she will? Well, maybe we'll find out more about that next week. 
But now let's go to the very last page of the first section, and here we are with Dick's adventures. Oh, yes, and I'm sure that today Dick's going to start a new adventure, and I wonder what it'll be. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. That's that music for Adventure to Stick. Dick is fishing with his Uncle Jim. After a while, he becomes lazy and drowsy and leans back against a tree. His Uncle Jim has been telling Dick about his grandfather in the early days of America. Dick, who is becoming sleepy, says drowsily. Oh, gee whiz, Uncle Jim. Did your grandfather really find gold in California in 1849? Oh, I sure wish I could have been there. And Dick's eyes close. Suddenly, dreamland magic makes the years fade back, back, back. And Dick is a printer's devil in the drowsy shop of the California Star, a newspaper. Dick is busy setting the type. The editor, a man named Kemble, says first picture, second row. Ah, the trouble with this newspaper, Dick, is that there's no real exciting news. California's one sunny day after another. We still have half a page to fill. Well, what, what about that letter you just received, sir? Uh, the one from John Augustus Sutter? Oh, I don't believe a word of it. Well, time to go home, Dick. Yeah, but, but maybe it's true, sir. Oh, mere rumor. And then, last picture, second row, Kemble hears a commotion outside. He and Dick hurry out the door. Hey, what's that crowd gathering for? First picture, bottom row, they make their way to the center of a crowd and see three bearded men holding bags in their hands. Hey, what's the excitement about? And one of the men shouts, Gold! The rivers are running with gold! And last picture, breathlessly, Dick and Editor Kemble rush back to the shop to put in print the most sensational story ever to hit California. See, Mr. Kemble? Sutton must have discovered gold. Why, this is the greatest news in America! Gold being discovered. Yes, and this was what Sutter had written to the editor in the letter that Dick referred to. Oh, that'll make a big story in the newspaper. Oh, you bet. A big story in the newspapers and an exciting story for us to read because that was an exciting day in American history. And we'll hear more about this next week. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and Rusty's in the middle of a dangerous adventure. And we'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty Riley and Tex are heading for the Milestone Farm with Silver Land, the last of a famous bloodline of hunting horses. This news has been heard by Velvet Kane, a not-too-honest man who also raises hunting horses. Velvet Kane doesn't want Silver Lad to reach the Milestone Farm before he can sign a contract with a wealthy South American. So Velvet Kane has sent two of his men to intercept the truck that Tex is driving. Kane's men have set up a detour sign that leads Tex and Rusty off the main highway. And at this moment, Tex finds his truck heading along a narrow path in the woods. He pulls into a stop. Rusty gets out. Hey, there's something queer about this, Tex. This is a detour from the main highway. There should be a lot of cars using it, but there's just one set of tire tracks. Well, that sure is queer, Rusty. Here, wait, I'll take a look. Can hey, you see, Tex? Yeah, you're right, Rusty. Only one car has been over this road lately. If that detour sign's a practical joke, it ain't funny. Because we can't turn around. We just have to keep going, Tex. Must lead to a farm or something. Last picture, top row. They approach a bridge. Hey, that was a right good guess of yours, lad. There's a light over yonder. Any kind of a house will have a turnaround space. 
Yeah, and they can tell us anyway if this detour's on the level. Meanwhile, first picture bottom roll. At the Milestone Farm, Mr. Miles has a visitor. It is the wealthy horseman from South America. Mr. Miles is saying... Uh, I believe, Mr. Caldaris, that you wish to purchase a number of yearlings of the bloodline of the famous hunter stallion, Gallant Corporal. Right? Uh, that is correct, senor. I would have paid any price to establish that line on my ranch. But alas, I am informed that the last of these hunters was lost in the stable fire. So I am about to buy, as second choice, all the yearlings from a senor can. I am not too happy... But I have no choice. I see. Well, if you, uh, if you haven't already closed the deal, you may be interested to know that I have just bought Silver Lad, a son of Gallant Corporal. Oh, but that is wonderful, Senor Mike. If that is true, I will contract for all the yearlings you will sell in the next three years. Well, Silver Lad is on his way here now. You can look him over at the Junior League Horse Show at the Lexington Trotters Track tomorrow. <laughs> mountain shack where Kane's men are waiting for the truck carrying Silver Lad. Porky suddenly exclaims, Hey, they're coming, Scrub. I can see the headlights through the trees. Okay, Porky. Wait till they round the bend and then sneak down to the bridge and plant that firecracker. Oh, I'm glad that Mr. Miles told that man from South America that he's found Silver Lad. Yes, because now Mr. Miles can sell horses to Caldaris. And Mr. Caldaris will be getting the best part. Yes, if Velvet Kane's men don't blow up that bridge and wreck the truck. Oh, do you think they will? Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now it's time to go to the second section of Puck the Comic Week. Oh, and I know who'll be there. That funny, funny Dagwood. And you're right. So here we go on the first page of the second section with Dagwood and Blondie. I'm a food, I'm a fum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood is at the office, busy working, when suddenly a shout splits the air. Bumstead! Come into my office. Yes, sir. Bumstead, there's $10,000 in this envelope, and it has to get to the bank immediately. Wow, $10,000. I'll take it right over myself. And last picture, top row, Dagwood is sitting in the park on a bench between two hobos. Gee, what a beautiful day. Uh, yeah, positively elegiastic. First picture, second row, Dagwood is watching an auction. Gee, I love to watch auctions. Fifteen, fifteen, going, 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 and sold with a man picking the lady's pocket. Dagwood stalls one way and another, enjoying himself, until he sees that it's almost three o'clock. He dances around a corner for the bank and sees the guard locking up. Hey, wait, wait, I have to deposit this money. Let me in, let me in, let me in. Last picture, second row, the guard pushes Dagwood back. The bank is closed for the day. You'll have to come back tomorrow. First picture, third row, Dagwood comes in the house. Hey, Blondie, Blondie, there's $10,000 in this envelope, and I've got to keep it overnight. Blondie tells him he can't sleep with that money in the house, and Daisy the dog goes... <laughs> Hours and hours later, we see Dagwood sitting up in his pajamas, the dog beside him, a gun in his lap, a baseball bat in one hand, and bricks on the floor beside him, drinking a cup of coffee, trying to keep awake. Uh, it's only 2 a.m., and I've done everything I can think of to keep me awake. in the morning, Dagwood looks out the window. Last picture, third row. There are bags under his eyes. His cheeks are sagging. His eyes are so tired they're watering. And his mouth looks like a twisted scrawl. It's getting daylight. 
Well, it won't be long now until the bank opens and I can deposit this money. <laughs> First picture, bottom row. Dagwood is the first man in the bank. He hands the envelope with the $10,000 to the teller. And happy to have it out of his hands, he sighs. Ah, deposit this, please. Ah, yes, sir. Oh, thank heavens, that's over. The bank teller looks inside the envelope and then says, Ah, but Mr. Bumstead, uh, there's nothing in this envelope but an old canceled contract. And Dagwood goes, No! Second picture, bottom row, Dagwood staggers into the office, hardly able to keep awake. And Mr. Dithers greets him. Oh, Dagwood, dear boy, I gave you the wrong envelope last night. The one with the $10,000 sat on my desk all night. Oh! And Dagwood slides to the floor and goes sound asleep. The last picture, Dithers drags him out of his office. If you're going to sleep, you're going to sleep in your own office. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't that silly. After all the trouble that Dagwood went to stay awake and protect the money, then he finds out there was nothing in that envelope after all. (laughs) Yes, but if he hadn't dawdled at the auction and in the park with the hobos, he would have gotten (laughs) to the bank in time, and this wouldn't have happened to him. So I guess it's just his own fault. (laughs) Yes, I guess it's just his own fault. But I still don't blame him for being mad at Mr. Dithers for making a mistake. No, neither do I. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Oh, look, on page three there's Donald Duck, my favorite, favorite. And we'll read your favorite, favorite right away. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze jump, squeeze jump, squeeze a chicka chat. Let's have music to fit a quack, quack. Daisy has asked Donald if he will go skating with her. It's a brand new rink, Donald. Will you take me? Why, of course, Daisy, darling. You, uh, you do know how to skate. But I was roller skating champ of my town. A few minutes later, they're in Donald's car, heading for the skating rink. Daisy is saying, Uh, but this is ice skating, Donald. Skating, skating, toots. Relax. Last picture, top row. We're at the skating rink. Donald and Daisy have their ice skates on. Daisy pushes off and sails across the ice as graceful as a gazelle. Then Donald gives himself a push, and his feet slip out from under him. Uh He shoots up in the air Uh and comes down and lands flat on his face. Second picture, bottom row. Uh He crawls off the ice and calls back to Daisy. Stay there, Tuts. I'll be back in a minute. Short time later, he enters a sporting goods store. And last picture, we're back at the skating rink. And there is Donald skating beside Daisy. She wearing ice skates, and Donald skimming over the ice on roller skates. Like I said, Tots, I was roller skating camp of my town. Wasn't that funny? Donald acted so smart about being such a fine skater. He said, skating is skating. Yes, but when he tried out the ice skates, he found out he wasn't as good as he thought. (laughs) No, but doesn't he look funny skating there with roller skates when everybody else is ice skating? Yes, he certainly does. (laughs) Well, now look across the page on page four. There's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, and you remember that Flash is on a strange planet called Titan. And remember that everything they've seen on Titan is positively huge. Yes, there are giants there, but Flash and the others don't know that yet. No, they don't. And the giants there are so huge that the hand of one of them could practically crush a man the size of Flash. But Flash and the others haven't seen them yet because they keep in hiding. 
Wouldn't you feel fine one today? This, this suspense is killing me. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rigga Rigga Doon Doon Saskimatash. Let's set music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> As they face the huge cave, the pilot says, Hey, there's no doubt about some huge man-like thing lives in there. Flash grimly starts toward the cave. Well, what are we waiting for? He says to two of his men, Hey, you two stand guard out here while we go in and take a look around. So leaving the two men on guard outside, Flash, Dale, and the three of the others enter the cave. Last picture top row. And whatever it is, it certainly is primitive. Midas says, Yeah, and dangerous. Look at that stone hatchet, that huge club. Hey, listen. Firing. First picture, bottom row, flash orders. Quick, to the cave mouth. The guards are firing on something. Hey, what's that grinding noise? Suddenly, they see the cave opening disappear. Now, look, something's pushed a boulder against the entrance. Flash starts to scramble to the top of the boulder. There's space at the top. Maybe we can wriggle out. Yeah, good idea. Last picture, Midas sees the opening near the roof. He says... Oh, we can get out easy enough. Suddenly, Flash exclaims, Hey, wait, wait. See there? And we see a giant hand waiting to seize whoever tries to crawl through. Whatever it is, it's waiting for us. Oh, isn't that terrible? They're locked up in the cave. Yes, made prisoners by the giant. And, and he's waiting right there outside the cave to grab Flash and the others if they try to sneak out. Oh, I'm glad Flash saw that hand in time. So am I. My, I wonder what he will do. Well, we'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Greedy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.